interpersonal interactions. Um, so I will be talking more about uh, magnetic monopoles, um, which of course uh, some of the speakers have already um, touched upon. And I will be talking about um, them from more from the theoretical perspective. Um, and in fact, there will be the talk after me by Aditya will um, focus on the more experimental side of this um, same thing. And uh, I should also say that this is work that I've been doing in collaboration with Oli Gould and David Hall. Uh, I don't hear you anymore. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. But we don't hear Artu, no? Mm -hmm. Artu, we, we, we lost you. Yeah. So we obviously got booted off. So. Right. Can you, can you hear me now? I've mm, to... Yes. Yeah. We're saying your collaborators. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So can you move to the next? Uh, next slide. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so just to motivate this, um, so what uh, I will be to, the reason why I'm um, interested in particular in heavy ion collisions is that they have the strongest um, magnetic fields in basically in the known known universe. And um, the reason why you have this strong magnetic field, I would I would imagine that most people here um, are fully aware of this, but is basically just that you have two very highly charged particles flying past each other and they induce a very strong magnetic field. And in particular, when we look at ultra peripheral collisions, just at the time when they fly past each other, you get an extremely strong magnetic field. And um, so, so basically from the theoretical perspective, my interest is, is really in understanding what happens in that kind of strong magnetic fields. So can you move to the next? Page. And here are just um, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, some of the field strengths. So we have um, the LHC magnets themselves uh, are close to being the strongest um, of magnets made by humans, um, and they are permanent um, of, of, for a long that that retain their um, field strength for a, for a long time, and they are around ten tesla which is roughly 10 to minus 15 uh, GeV squared. In certain types of neutron stars called magnetars, you have a lot, a lot stronger magnetic fields, roughly um, four times 10 to minus five GeV squared. So that's 10 orders of magnitude stronger than um, the LHC magnet. But where we have even stronger magnetic fields is in heavy ion collisions. And at the LHC um, in the 5 TeV um, per nucleon um, collisions, the magnetic field at the strongest was around um, 7 GeV squared. So you can see that is a lot higher than even in magnetars with uh, um, the, the strongest of naturally occurring magnetic fields in the universe. And these magnetic fields have um, obviously a number of um, potentially interesting new physics phenomena and people have been talking about some of them, but what I will be focusing on are magnetic monopoles. And also I will say a little bit about barrier number violation if I have time at the end. Thanks, can you move to the next page? And basically it's just to again motivate um, where we are. So if magnetic charges, if magnetic monopoles exist, then electrodynamics has a duality symmetry between electricity and magnetism. The equations uh, that govern them would be identical, and therefore we would have all the same phenomena for the magnetic particles that we have currently um, for electric particles. And the other important thing to note about magnetic monopoles is that if they exist, then Dirac quantization condition tells us that their charge must be an integer multiple of the Dirac charge, which is a two pi over the elementary electric charge, the charge of the electron in natural units. And so therefore, 
they're actually strongly charged. Yeah, next page, please. And so obviously people have been searching for, um, for monopoles. Here are the bounds uh, from Medal experiment, which I am part of. And as Wendy mentioned, so, so Atlas has also been searching uh, for monopoles. If you go to the next slide, I've got um, Atlas here. And both of these are from proton-proton collisions. And so what they actually give is, uh, if you haven't found any monopoles, is you get an upper bound on the production cross section. And um, in order to convert that into a bound on the monopole mass, you need to have a theoretical calculation of the cross section. And so in these plots, that's the, um, the solid lines, which are the Drell-Yan uh, prediction. We move to the next slide. So the Drell-Yan, which I think is the, is basically based on the same idea, which I think also the super chick that was mentioned that uses, which is just to take the usual perturbative um, result uh, for electric particles and replace the charge by um, the, uh, the magnetic charge. So you're basically just using uh, the duality. And um, that means you use the same calculation to calculate the production cross section. But um, the problem with that is that um, the Dirac charge in natural units is 20.7, and that's a lot a bigger number than one. And therefore, uh, these, product, uh, these processes are actually non perturbative, and you can't trust uh, the uh, perturbative Brelian result. Can you move to the next slide, please? So, what that means is that the, uh, the results are not um, reliable, but there are also some theoretical arguments that actually um, they are way off and that the actual cross-section can be very small. And uh, that's in particular for, for um, solitonic monopoles like tuft polakov monopoles in grand unified theories, where one can essentially, because they are not point-like, they are large objects. They have a high entropy in some sense. Um, Witt and Drukier and Nusinov argued uh, that the production cross section in any elementary particle collisions is suppressed by an exponential of um, minus four over alpha, where alpha is the fine structure constant. And that uh, is a very, very small number, 10 to minus uh, 200. And that basically means that if that's true, then you're never going to be able to produce uh, monopoles in elementary particle collisions, at least solitonic monopoles. I should say this has not been confirmed by an explicit calculation. This is uh, uh, just a qualitative argument. But anyway, this means that there is a big uncertainty about uh, the, the cross section in proton proton collisions. Next slide, please. So what, therefore, we uh, decided to, to look at instead was the effect of the magnetic field, a strong magnetic field in heavy ion collisions. And using the uh, duality, we can understand the effects of the magnetic field by understanding what happens in very strong electric fields. And in strong electric fields, you have Swinger pair production process. It's basically producing electron-positron pairs when you have a strong uh, electric field. Um, and that's essentially just a tunneling process through the Coulomb barrier, which produces these pairs from the vacuum. Next slide. And um, this, the rate of this process can be calculated, has been calculated um, using, using instanton uh, techniques. And you get basically a rate per space-time volume because you are assuming a constant uniform a field. And um, this calculation was done um, by Affleck, Alvarez, and Manton, and uh, the expression is given here. So this is for electrically charged particles in, in an electric field. And you can see that um, it, um, it has this exponential um, factor, but if the field is sufficiently strong, so the expo exponent goes like one over field strength. If the field is sufficiently strong, then the exponential uh, factor goes away and you have 
um, unsuppressed production of, of electron positron pairs. Okay, next slide, please. Now, the, the important thing, however, for us about this result is that um, it does not, it's not perturbative, it does not rely on perturbation theory, and therefore it does not require a weak coupling. It uh, therefore applies just as well to magnetic monopoles, which have a coupling of uh, approximately 20. And so therefore we can use the duality to get the per production rate by just replacing um, the charge by uh, the magnetic charge and the electric field by the magnetic field. And we get this expression given here. And so this basically, the only difference now is that the second term in the exponent, which is a positive one, is now actually very large, um, roughly 100. So the stro strong magnetic charge actually enhances the production massively. And that means that um, the, the field, the magnetic field that is needed for the pair production is parametrically different from uh, the electric field that is needed for Schwinger pair production of electrons and positrons. But basically that's given by m squared over g cubed, where m is the mass of the particles, the monopoles you are producing, and g is the, um, the magnetic charge. But this uh, fact, the fact that it's uh, one over uh, m squared over g cubed means that um, the field that is needed is lower than it would be for uh, the electric charges where it's uh, m squared over e. So from this we can then um, just see what kind of bound you get. When the LHC was switched on, the magnets were switched on, no monopoles were produced, and uh, from that you already get a bound of a of a few keV. If monopoles with masses less than a few keV existed, then they would have been produced um, by the magnets themselves. Looking at the fields in magnetars, we find uh, uh, the bound uh, of roughly one a GeV. Um, if monopoles uh, lighter than that existed, then they would have been then they would be constantly produced in um, in, in magnetars, and that would drain away the magnetic field, and therefore they would not have such a strong magnetic field anymore. Next slide, please. Thanks. And so then uh, what we wanted to do was to look at this in um, heavy ion collisions where the fields are a lot str stronger than this. And um, we can approximate uh, the field in heavy ion collisions by just solving um, the equations for two charges flying past each other, and that gives this expression here. And um, for, the, for the LHC collisions, um, the parameters here, V is the maximum field strength at 7.3 GV squared. And omega um, essentially is a parameter that gives you the time scale of the process, how, how strong, how, how long the field remains that um, that's strong for inverse time scale. Uh, that's gamma over R, where gamma is the Lorentz factor and R is the radius of the of the of the ions, and that's roughly 70 GeV. So that's the field that we were then using um, in order to to calculate this production. Next slide, please. And um, Essentially, one can scale out things. The only thing that um, the calculation actually depends on is this parameter psi, um, which is m, the mass times omega, time scale parameter over g uh, b. And if um, psi is zero, then we are just talking about the constant field. But at the LHC, when you put in the, the numbers, find that uh, psi is the mass of the particle you're producing by two times n a GV, where n is the charge in units, charge of the monopole in units of the Dirac charge. And so therefore, if you are looking at monopoles, which are, um, which are of order, let's say 100 a GV, uh, then this parameter psi is actually quite large. It's a 50 or something. And that means that we have a highly time dependent 
field. It's not nowhere near a constant, and that means that the time dependence needs to be taken into account. Um, luckily, we can do that if we ignore self interactions. We can even do that analytically, and we can find the production rate um, ignoring the self interactions of the monopoles. And that's given by this equation at the bottom of the slide exponential of minus four times the mass over omega. And the interesting thing about this is that it actually only depends on the on the on the time scale omega rather than um, any anything to do with the field strength. This is as long as the field strength is sufficiently large that, um, that you get production. But in the in the limit of large psi, um, the relevant parameter is the time scale, which was uh, omega is roughly 70 GV. And that already shows you that um, actually the masses that uh, we are going to be talking about are of that order. OK, so next slide. So that, that result was for, uh, that was, was ignoring self-interactions. And of course, um, because the coupling is large, you really don't want to ignore them. Numerically, we can, um, we can uh, include them um, either first order in an expansion or actually to all orders. And here is just to show what the, what the results look like. So uh, the y-axis is the action which is inside the um, exponent uh, or the rate. And remember, xi plus zero is constant field. So you can see that for all of these results, when you um, go to time dependent case, the action decreases and therefore the rate increases. So the time dependence actually enhances the production. You can also see that when you include the self interactions, whether you do that to leading order to, or to all orders, uh, the action is lower than for the, uh, for the case where you ignore them. And therefore, in, the inclusion of the self interactions enhances the rate as well. And um, even though we can't do the full calculation um, for the relevant, um, to all orders for the relevant values of xi because it's numerically too hard, if this trend continues, then it basically is saying that if we take the free as non, uh, non interacting case, that's going to give us a good conservative estimate for what uh, the real production rate is. And um, from that, we can basically get this uh, estimate that masses, we should be able to reach masses of order 80 GeV at the LHC. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other thing that was not included in this calculation, apart from time dependence, was, um, uh, was the uh, uh, finite size of monopoles. So this was assuming that mono monopoles are point-like. Most monopoles that actually appear in different theories are solitonic. They are like the tuft polekov monopole, semi-classical um, objects. And, um, and for those, it's not clear that the point-like approximation is valid. Um, in order to calculate the production of those, you have to find uh, the same instant on solution in the full field theory. And that's a lot harder. But we've managed to do that um, with David Ho, my student. And um, first, we were looking at the Spaleron, which is essentially the classical um, a, a, a classical configuration, the, the barrier height that you need to go over in the tunneling. And, um, and that's just shown here. If you were at non zero temperature, the rate would be given by exponential of minus uh, this Spaleron energy over temperature. Um, if you move forward, we can see um, what happens. Can you move to the next slide, please? Um, oh, sorry, can you go back? Sorry, this is, um, if you, can you click, uh, click the image for a few times? Oh, does it not work? Um, that's okay. There's a, there was just a plot um, for um, how the, how the energy depends on the, on the parameters, but that's okay. Uh, move to the next, please. 
Um, what we really want a, is the instanton, which is the four-dimensional solution that describes the quantum tunneling process. And that's uh, just shown here. Um, you also find this numerically. And, um, and this, um, the rate is given by exponential of minus the action of this instant. And then now if you click the image, you should see. Yeah, so this, is, this shows how the action depends on the field strength, which is the x-axis. And we see that, um, um, and, and the, uh, the black curve is the, is the um, a point particle result. And we can see that the finite size due to the solitonic nature reduces the action again, and therefore enhances the production. Um, depending on, on the parameters, beta here is, um, uh, measures the ratio of the uh, scalar and vector masses um, in the French unified theory. Um, but um, what we can see that for all values, uh, the action is lower than for the point particles. And the other interesting thing is that if the field becomes strong enough, the action goes to zero, which means that there is a, uh, there's no quantum barrier anymore. And uh, the, uh, the process becomes classical, you get the classical instability against production of monoflows. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, so here is just to summarize, uh, summarize this. So for constant field and point-like particles, we've got the first expression. When we include time dependence and go to the highly time dependent case, we have uh, at the LHC, it's the rapid pulse expression here. It's actually given by exponential of minus four M over omega. And um, when we include uh, the, uh, the finite monopole size for solitonic monopoles, and that, that also enhances the production, and that there is a classical instability at sufficiently strong uh, fields. Now, we currently can't include all of these effects in the same calculation, but what we can see is that both time dependence and the finite size enhance the production. Now, um, and that basically then means that we should be able to take the constant field result as a hopefully a reliable um, conservative estimate of the actual production cross section um, or production rate. And now, thanks. Um, so, this is the final thing I just wanted to say because uh, something very similar um, also then happens even if you don't have monopoles. If you just look at the standard model itself, in the standard model, um, when you put it in a very strong magnetic field, uh, baryon number gets violated. And the way you, you can see that is by looking at the Spaleron configuration. That's essentially the same thing uh, we did with the monopole anti monopole pair production. There's a similar electrovix Spaleron, which um, violates baryon number. Uh, this was found by Manton and Klinghammer uh, in the standard model. And again, the usual way to think about it is that it tells you the rate at non-zero temperature. Um, but again, we found these Spaleron, um, Spaleron configurations numerically in, in an external magnetic field, and the energy of the Spaleron as a function of the field is given in this plot. And what this again shows, the same thing that we saw um, with the monopole uh, air production, is that the Spaleron energy goes to zero at, um, at field strength, uh, which in, in this plot is uh, the MH squared over MW squared. There's a critical field strength. And if the magnetic field becomes as strong as that, then the Spaleron process, baryon number violation process in the standard model is no longer suppressed. The vacuum in the standard model becomes unstable against baryon number violation. And if you go to the next slide, um, we can put in the numbers and we find what this um, field strength is that is needed for the baryon number violation with a constant field. 
So this is assuming a constant uh, magnetic field, and that's uh, five times ten to the four uh, GeV squared. Now that's some uh, ten thousand times uh, stronger magnetic field than we have at the LHC in the even in the center of the collision. But it's only ten times uh, ten thousand times uh, stronger. So it's a it's not a, a huge factor. In order to reach that, if everything just works in the same way, um, you would need um, to collide ions with um, with the Lorentz factor of ten to the seven, roughly. Um, and um, of course, something that's something which is which is not uh, not realistic in any kind of near future. But I would actually be interested in hearing from people whether it's in principle possible that in some distant future, someone manages to do that. So you need um, collision energy per nucleon of uh, roughly 10 to the 4 TeV. And, um, and yes, yeah, so if you could reach that, then baryon number would be violated in the collisions. Essentially, you would see um, protons dissolving. Um, the other thing which I should say is that in this calculation, we have ignored uh, the time dependence because you can't include it in this calculation. But if the same thing that we saw with monopoles is true, that the time dependence actually enhances this process, then um, you need lower fields than this. And actually, uh, the omega, if, if omega, the time dependence parameter, is the relevant quantity, again, in this case, like it seems to be for monopoles, then that is actually close to the electroweak uh, scale of 70 GeV. So if, if that is the relevant um, quantity, then actually with the LHC, we may not be uh, terribly far from the energies, collision energies, where this process would start to, start to occur. And so therefore it would be, interesting to understand whether there's any way uh, this could be observed. Of course, uh, I'm, I'd imagine that it's incredibly difficult to see uh, uh, rare baryon number violating events um, when you have so many baryons in the collisions, but still, um, in principle, this is saying that it might, might be something that is happening in those collisions. Anyway, I'll stop here. Um, thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Ardo, for this nice talk. The uh, presentation is open for discussions. We cannot accept many be because we are pretty late. Uh, I don't see any rise. And I have a question myself. What is, in terms of phenomenology, uh, do you think we should look for what highly ionizing um, particles in uh, let let interactions at the LHC? That would be the signal to look for. Um, Highly ionizing also the next talk by Aditya will be discussing the um, experimental search. Um, and so for, for monopoles, um, obviously uh, highly ionizing particles or actually with metal uh, is, is trapped monopoles that are being, um, being searched. And, um, but, but essentially um, any, I mean, there are obviously different ways you can, you can look for magnetic monopoles and, um, those are independent of the of the production process, and so therefore um, the search itself would uh, would work in the same way as, uh, as. But the system, the colliding system, you're really proposing to look for this in uh, in lead lead, not in PP. That's right. This would be lead lead. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question for Arto? Uh, you know the highest. Uh, center of mass energy collisions uh, that we have access on on earth are the ones from ultra energy cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere those correspond to 400 tv in the center of mass so if uh, and those are nuclei of course those they are not lead nuclei but uh, iron is one one candidate so we, we do have collisions at say 400 TV of iron against oxygen, nitrogen in the upper atmosphere. So this sphaleron, electroweak sphaleron could, could be produced if, uh, if you include this time dependence. So what would be the, in this case, the experimental uh, 
I mean, what, 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 do, how, how can you see value number violation in those type of interactions? Is there any? Yeah, so I think that's a very, very good, uh, good point because yes, I think that's right. And uh, the question then is indeed how, how would you know if um, in that collision one of the, essentially, I would imagine that what would happen is that one of the variants, one of the protons, um, uh, turns into into leptons and um, how would you how would you know if that happens and um, and yes as I'd imagine it's, it's not easy easy to to come up with uh, with a way of searching for that but um, in principle that might be might be observable mm -hmm. uh, Marco hi thanks for the nice summary again so I did not quite understand how you include the time dependence. So, I mean, you, you said something about that because I think the time independent magnetic field is basically like Schwinger production pretty much the same, right? But how did you say you include the time dependence? Maybe you can. Um, the way, I mean, the, yeah, the way we do that is by taking the, uh, the background magnetic field and analytically continuing that to Euclidean time. There are different ways. I mean, you can do that for um, for for the non-interacting case, for the when you ignore self-interactions, you can you can also just do it by solving um, solving the Dirac equation in the background of the magnetic field. But if you want to include interactions, which we do, then um, then you have to um, do it using the instanton technique, which essentially involves taking the um, uh, the background magnetic field analytically continuing that to Euclidean uh, time and finding finding the instanton solution uh, numerically in in that background it's a numerically uh, hard calculation but it's it is um, there's nothing particularly conceptually um, difficult uh, about it so it's, it is a doable calculation is that conceptually like this Coleman, like this Coleman method, or something very different? It's yeah, it's uh, it, it is just finding the uh, finding the instant on in a time dependent uh, background, and and yeah, so it's it, the the challenge is that you have to solve um, the non local um, non 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 local minimization, or not not even minimization problem, or optimization problem, but. Um, but yeah, so you can. It, it's quite easy to write down the equation that you want to solve. It's just solving that equation that's difficult. Okay, thanks for that. Oh, 